Hello there to this <clears throat> post recording uh, from the Shark webinar from yesterday evening. Um, let's dive uh, right in. So today we're going to talk about everything about sharks. It's a talk um, about sharks and everything that's relevant for them. A couple words about Zoom. Please uh, keep your uh, microphones off and your video off. Um, your questions can be put in the chat. I will review them and I will answer them along the way um, or at the end. If you want to view my uh, window, you want to keep that middle one and pin video, um, therefore that you can see me. So I think everybody uh, can see me now. So I will just start right away with our talk about sharks. Just a couple of words about myself. My name is Simon Lorenz. I'm German. I'm based in Hong Kong for the last 12 years. I love everything about scuba diving. Um, I'm also a tech diver and a free diver, and I've been working as an underwater photographer for the last few years. Um, I'm an author for uh, several mag magazines. I write scuba-related uh, articles, um, and obviously my photos are in there as well, and I'm a presenter at dive shows. I'm also a PADI instructor and have developed my own sort of photo coaching uh, curriculum over the last few years because there's a real, real place where you can study this, so uh, I've developed a way to... Um, yeah, coach people uh, on their underwater photography. I also want to mention my ambassadors. Isotta is my housing uh, um, housing brand um, that I use, and uh, the brands Hollis Bear and Atomic have supported my work for the last few years as well. So I'm very, very grateful to all of these. Um, I'm also a shark lover. Um, this is a photo that happened in Florida. Uh, taken by Terry Roberts. And with this, I just want to mention that not all of the photography is mine. I haven't actually seen all of the sharks and all of the behaviors. So uh, when I used other people's photography, I will mention it, but there will also be a watermark. As you can see in the bottom left, Terry's uh, watermark is right here. A couple words about uh, Insider Divers. This is the uh, company that we have in order to provide scuba diving trips all around the world. You can see pretty much anywhere where there's good scuba diving, uh, we are there. Um, and we organize trips for groups, and our groups are between five and 15, sometimes a bit more, uh, guests, and we have a lot of fun together. Our trips are either uh, land-based or liveaboard-based, so we have both depending on what we think is better for the location. Uh, most of our trips are scuba diving, but we also have tech and free dive trips. Um, and we also do very specific things for photography workshops where we uh, do only photography all day long. Um, all of our trips are group trips and there's always somebody, an expert or an insider, as I like to call it, uh, with you. So a photographer or instructor or a tech instructor, somebody who knows something that's really useful in this area. And our itineraries are therefore also a bit special. We try to make special itineraries that uh, make it interesting uh, for you to join a group trip rather than travel by yourself. And one thing that's really important for us is education and coaching. So uh, we want to make sure that we never stop learning. And so on every trip, we provide presentations such as this one um, in order to improve what we know about the animals that we're diving with. So let's talk about sharks. I'm gonna start with this image, which was taken in South Africa um, in a Liwo show. And uh, this was the moment this day uh, was the moment where I decided that I'm going to uh, give up my day job or my, my, my office job and uh, do underwater professionally. Um, I was here in the ocean, in the open bottom ocean at the end of a, a shark dive and the uh, operator uh, started throwing some sardines at me and I just loved it. I was so at ease around these sharks um, <clears throat> that I will introduce later. And it was such a big moment for me. I seemingly something clicked uh, uh, generally being in South Africa with all these sharks. Um, and that made my decision easier. Um, and less than a year later, uh, I had given up my job and was working as an underwater photographer. So today we're gonna to talk about sharks. I'm gonna talk a little bit about types of sharks, um, also about habitats where they live, uh, some of their behaviors that you can observe or you can observe once pointed in that direction. Um, I'm also gonna share quite a bit on shark biology. Um, this animal is extremely unique, different than other fish. I'm gonna point out some of these things. And at the end, I'll have some tips for scuba divers on how to dive with sharks. So this is how my mother would see it, or my parents would see it. It's like a, you know, an evil monster coming out of the deep. To me, they're beautiful animals. They're really lovely looking. I mean, some of them really look a little bit dorky even, or, or, or completely harmless like this whale shark. And in fact, it is completely harmless, this shark. Um, they're also great photographic uh, subjects. So here you've got uh, a whale shark uh, um, silhouette. It's a beautiful animal to photograph. Here we've got an oceanic white tip. 
here's another picture of a whale shark. This is really great to practice your art with. And I think better than most fish, they are extremely good models for your photography. So let's talk about sharks. Um, there are two groups and one group are the constant swimmers. A lot of sharks always have to swim and some of them swim very fast like silky sharks and others are more nice and steady like these whale sharks, but generally they all have to swim. Here's a sand tiger and his friends sleeping. So even while they are relaxing, they need to swim. That is because they need to have water flowing through their open mouth past their gills that you can see these five gill slits here on the left and that is how they oxygenate their blood. So here you are in a sand tiger bedroom. They are cruising here very slowly and it is a sleep-like trance where they sleep um, uh, or rest their brains and their bodies but they have to keep swimming. Some of them uh, rest in currents. Here are gray reef sharks in the Maldives that find a nice spot in the, um, in the currents and, uh, and surf in these currents and supposedly are relaxing in that time. It's not really sleeping, but it is really relaxing to them. And then there's a second group of sharks, which I call the bottom breathers. They have the capability of breathing at the bottom. For example, a white tip reef shark can breathe at the bottom. You can see here is opening the mouth, the gills are closed, and then the next instant closes the mouth and the gills open, and therefore he has oxygenated his blood. This is what only certain species of shark can do. Some of those species are actually fully stationary and live on the bottom, like this wobbegong in Australia. They live only on the seafloor and they will only move when necessary. This is a different wobbegong, a tasseled wobbegong in, um, in Raja Ampat. And, uh, and it will only swim when there is a real benefit. In this case, you can see it's a male swimming uh, because there's another male approaching a female that he's hogging. So this is the only time that these wobbegong will swim. And some don't swim at all. They walk. So this is a, a picture I took from Shutterstock from a walking shark. So these sharks actually walk on their fins. And although they can swim, they will not swim at all. They'll just walk on the bottom. They come in all kinds of sizes. Here's your standard gray reef shark. Uh, people always think that they're very big, but they're not that big. They're probably about a meter 20 to a meter and a half. Suppose we can reach two meters, but I've not seen a two meter one. They do look a lot bigger when we see them underwater due to the magnification. These are a size bigger. So these are oceanic uh, black tips. Those are the ones I was diving with there in South Africa. They look very similar, but they're a big chunk bigger. So they can reach up to two and a half meters of length. Next step up is the bull shark. You can see it already on the girth, on the body. They're really, really big. Um, and uh, uh, they can reach up to three and a half meters of length. Next one up is the tiger shark. So this is where we start getting a bit more dangerous animals, animals that you need to know how to be around. They can reach up to five meters, although I have heard that some can reach up to six meters length. And then we've got the great white that is definitely the most dangerous shark that is really the only shark you can't dive with without the protection of a cage. And these sharks can be up to seven meters long. But we can get one size bigger, the super size, which is the whale shark. So the whale shark is actually, most of the time when we encounter them, they're not that big. So this is a, a whale shark that we can encounter on certain areas in Asia. This is in Tubataha, and they will be around five meters maybe, or six meters long, or maybe up to eight meters. But there is a place in the world in Galapagos where you can see the see the big pregnant females. So these are females in the prime of their life. They might be already over 50 years old and they are pregnant and they can be up to 14 meters long. So that is the biggest fish that ever swam the oceans, as we know. There are also really tiny ones like these cat eye sharks or these pajama sharks. They might only be between 20 and 30 centimeters. And then there is an even smaller one. This is the smallest one I've found so far online, which is the lantern shark. This photo here is by Andy Murch. Um, and that is only about 10 centimeters. So the spread of your fingers is the, about the length of this shark when it's fully grown. There's some real freaks and I call them freaks, but essentially it's the beauty of uh, the evolution that has developed around these sharks, um, giving them amazing adaptations to their food source. So here we've got the thresher sharks that we can see, for example, in Malapasqua, and their tail has evolved to be extremely long. Their tail can be up to the half of their body length, and they use that tail to whip sardines uh, and make them unconscious and then eat them. That's the way 
a prey. This is one I really like. This is a Port Jackson shark in South Africa, and sorry, in Australia, Southern Australia. And these sharks belong to the family of bullhead sharks that actually have poisonous barbs. You can see in this picture here where my mouse is circling, these uh, are the barbs after they have broken off. When they are younger, they look like this, and they're meant to protect the young shark of bigger sharks. So if they bite uh, onto this shark, there are these two poisonous barbs that can release a load of poison into the mouth of the predator. Of course, another freak of nature is the hammerhead, and I'm gonna explain the hammerhead, why it is shaped like that a little bit later. Then there are crazy ones like these. These are saw sharks uh, that actually have the teeth on the outside of their face. So you can see there are teeth in his mouth and there are teeth on his nose, which he uses to uh, look for prey in shallow water estuaries. And then there's the wobbegong, and this is the tasseled wobbegong in, uh, in Raja Ampat. And he has developed a beard-like structure, so in a way he looks more closer to me, but he's using it um, to be uh, camouflaged on the reef so that he can do his ambush prey. And then there are some more sharks that are really odd looking. So this is one of them. Uh, very rarely has been seen. Here's a photo I found on the internet of the mega mouth shark, which is actually bigger than a great white, smaller than a whale shark, but can reach up to nine meters of length and is also a filter feeder. So these are just some examples. There are a lot more. If you look in uh, online, you will find a lot of freak sharks out there, but I just wanted to point out a couple. So where do they live? What's their habitat? This obviously is a reef shark. So a gray reef shark lives close to the reef and around the reef. But other sharks like this oceanic white tip are fully pelagic. What we mean with pelagic is they live only offshore. They actually never come close to the reefs. They might visit some reefs in certain parts of the year, but they will not really like to come close to the reef. They spend their entire year pretty much in zero to 10 meters of water depth in the open ocean. Whale sharks can be pelagic and reef dwelling, but they will not come as close to the reef as maybe other sharks because of obviously due to their size, they need to be careful that they won't beach. But these sharks can be totally shallow in the reef, but they can also dive all the way deep. They are actually some of the deepest diving uh, fish that we know. There has been a record depth dive as a record dive of 2,400 meters that has been recorded with a tracker. Um, so we know that they dive up to two and a half kilometers deep, probably to find food source, although there's different theories what they might be doing there. They might actually gauge their orientation, who knows. But essentially they can live pelagic and they can live close to the reef. Others like these uh, gray reef sharks and what you see here in the top is a a black tip reef shark, they live only on the reef. And particularly black tip reef sharks stay on one reef their entire life. So if they found a reef, they might not venture out further than 500 meters or maximum a kilometer around this one reef. So if you know a place where you've got uh, black tip reef sharks, then you will be able to find them exactly again. Others live in the kelp, like this cow shark in South Africa, or on the reef bottom, like this wobbegong in Triton Bay. Um, and yet others, like this bamboo shark, will live in the muck and just stay close to the bottom, not even in the reef, but more on the sand. And then there is this crazy shark, which I'd like to mention, obviously I haven't seen him myself. These are photos I found online um, of the Greenland shark. And the Greenland shark not only dives extremely deep, but also drives extremely slow and in extremely cold water. So he will dive under the ice of the Arctic and will swim extremely slow and is uh, therefore also recorded to be the oldest being on earth. So the animal that can get at, uh, as old as 500 years has recently been proven. And um, that means they were, the specimen that are swimming around now might be already swimming here since the time of Christopher Columbus. So uh, pretty, pretty Im uh, impressive that we have sharks that swim to so slow that they can get this crazy age. Sharks also provide habitat for other animals. So they're hosts to all kinds of uh, opportunistic fish, such as these remoras on an oceanic black tip, or um, uh, these pilot fish on an oceanic white tip. These are fish that live around a shark, live in their slipstream, and live off the scraps that this shark will leave behind. Uh, we also have parasites. Here's another oceanic white tip with a big, ugly parasite that you can see here uh, sticking out of his gills. And you can see on the rest of his body, there are more parasites growing like that. 
Parasites like these is the reason why sharks visit cleaning stations. Here's a hammerhead in uh, Cocos, and he's searching these butterfly fish to come and clean him. In some places, uh, sharks have really crazy amounts of parasites, and Tubataha, which is probably the best place to scuba dive in the world with whale sharks, um, this place has a, a weird infestation that all whale sharks here have these crazy parasites all over the mouth. And when you zoom into these, what you can see on the top right hand, they're all isopods, so little sort of crustacean-like animals. And you can see when they move around, they leave an imprint um, uh, of themselves on the uh, outside of the shark. And, um, and you can see that as a red area around these spots. Some people believe that they come to Tubataha in order to get cleaned, but um, I've been there twice and we've never seen any real cleaning behavior. But we did see that sharks actually were breathing in the, the diver's bubbles, and we think that that might be a way to get rid of the parasites, perhaps. And coming back to the Greenland shark, he has the craziest parasite. There is a specific parasite that you can see here attached to the cornea, to the eye of the Greenland shark. And this is a specific parasite that is only found, or I tell now, I mean, only found on the uh, cornea of Greenland sharks. And all Greenland sharks seem to have it. And uh, this parasite has not been found on anything else. So it's, that's how specific evolution created a parasite that it will only live off the uh, eye of one specific animal. So let's talk about how they hunt. Um, some of them hunt in packs, but it's a little bit different um, than we have like pack hunters uh, on land like wolves. Um, here in the uh, Maldives, a good place to actually observe them um, uh, being in, in groups. At night, they will uh, come out. This is uh, taken in Yap. They will come out and they will hunt together. So they will swim together um, and try to scare up reef. If somebody finds uh, a reef fish, then they will all hunt for it at the same time, and one of them will get lucky. So in a way, they're cooperating to get their meals. Other predators, like the um, great white, are sole predators, and they will only hunt alone, and they will also not share. Then we've got ambush predators, like the wobbegong I mentioned earlier, who lies in ambush, waiting for some fish to swim right in front of his mouth, and then he will snap up and suck it into his mouth. And then, of course, we've got the filter feeder, the whale shark, who doesn't uh, predate, per se. He doesn't uh, chomp down on anything. He literally just swallows gallons and tons of water a day. Uh, a whale shark might filter as much as several tons of water a day and uh, will have up to um, 100 kilos of krill a day. Actually, I'm not quite sure how much. No, more like 20 to 30 kilograms a day of krill. All sharks are opportunists, which is why uh, they are sort of susceptible to uh, shark provisioning or shark feeding. Um, they're also very, very uh, pr um, predictable in terms of going for baited hooks that are not even meant for them. So here in the Maldives where fishing for sharks is forbidden, you can still see lots of sharks with hooks in them. Or here, this is the protected sand tiger in Australia. Um, this shark clearly went for a hook that wasn't meant for him and uh, managed to snap it off. And this uh, hook is now slowly growing out. And um, this is because sharks might go for any opportunity that presents themselves. Um, that is why if you ever encounter pilot whales, which is a very special experience, we just had it in Sri Lanka, you need to make sure you look behind you because the pilot whales are often trailed by oceanic white tips that seem to really, really enjoy going for the pilot whale poo. That's what I heard anyway. Um, the fact that they are opportunists uh, makes them, um, yeah, indeed possible to be seen um, with provisioning. So there are a few places in the world where you can see bull sharks. For example, Cabo Pulmo is a place where some time of the year you can see bull sharks naturally. But uh, aside from Palau and a few other places, it's very hard to see them. But then there are other places where if you provide in a structured way on a regular basis, a few fish scraps, you can get close to a big fish like this. This is a pregnant bull shark in Yucatan, Mexico, um, by a Carmen. And this is because they learn to react to these scraps and they're actually quite docile in the interaction with the handlers. So this is a different dive in Florida and with lemon sharks. And you can see that this handler has developed a technique to safely give lemon sharks these little scraps of fish and um, so you can create photos like that. Um, 
I got the Q in the Q&A the question if I am pro or con uh, shark provisioning. I think the most important thing about um, providing food to sharks is that it's not changing their behavior. If they have migration patterns, it should be change their migration behavior. And you have to make sure it doesn't stop them from hunting naturally. There have been quite a lot of studies around the world. And as far as I know, there's a few places in the Caribbean uh, with stingrays where actually the, the uh, health and the physique of stingrays has been um, uh, altered by provisioning of, of food. In most other places, for example, cage diving in South Australia and also South Africa, there seems to be no clear indicator that the sharks are coming specifically for that. They still are hunting their normal prey seals and, uh, and it doesn't seem to have any effect. So generally it seems to be accepted as long as it's not overdone and as long as the animals are treated respectfully. Another opportunist is the whale shark. So here you can see a whale shark around the uh, uh, nets in these Indonesian bagans. This is all over Indonesia can be encountered where they fish for these small fish. The whale sharks will come up and, uh, and try to get uh, scraps or try to even suck on the net to try and get these uh, little fish to come out. Some of the fishermen might provide some fish for us photographers so we can take some nice photos. Again, <coughs> <clears throat> That's a very small meal for a whale shark. He needs to eat 20, uh, 50 to 20 kilos uh, a day of uh, fish, and uh, and uh, they might get a handful of, of fish here. So uh, it shouldn't really alter their behavior. Sharks can be social, like uh, uh, white tip reef sharks uh, like to lie on top of each other if necessary. This is in Socorro, where there's not many areas to lie. They actually stack up on top of each other. But you often see, like in this picture earlier, that white tips often lie together, um, which seems to be a way of uh, socializing. Uh, in this, this is one of my favorite dives. This is Southwest Rocks in East Australia. Um, you can see the gray nurse sharks or sand tigers um, swim in circles together. It seems to be a social gathering of some sort. Um, they like to be in the same place together. Another shark that's definitely social are the hammerheads, which are known to school, like here in Cocos, or also in Galapagos. You can sometimes see them in schools of 100 or 200 or even 500 um, sharks coming together, uh, swimming together. So that is an interesting uh, social behavior um, that these sharks have. Let's go a little bit in detail on shark biology. Um, this shark's really developed extremely uh, different to other fish. And that is because sharks have been around for 400 million years, over 400 million years. So they were around when the dinosaurs were there. Here are some images of sharks, and I'll tell you in a moment why we don't actually know so well what they look like. Um, because they don't actually have a proper skeleton. I'll get to that in a moment. So just a thing to remember is sharks were already uh, around when the dinosaurs first started appearing and are therefore one of the oldest species groups in the world. Here's um, um, one um, sort of uh, evolutionary tree that I found online, which essentially uh, traces them back to these sort of very simple animals 420 million years ago. Um, and you can also see that uh, the top class here are sort of more like rays, right? And these uh, are um, also related to sharks. So all rays and sharks belong to the same family. They are called the elasmal branch. And elasmal branch means that they have a cartilage skeleton. Cartilage skeleton is basically the difference to a normal bone structure that all fish have. That makes them a lot lighter because it's all made of cartilage and a lot more flexible. It allows them to bend much faster and easier, turn on the spot, etc. And essentially it is more stable. Why is it more stable? That is because this cartilage skeleton can grow everywhere. Here we've got the cartilage skeleton of a stingray and you can see that the wings are entirely structured with these cartilage, not bones, but structures. And that makes them extremely stable. Here's one from a mobula ray, and you can see that the entire wings are threaded with these cartilage, uh, with, a, with a web of these uh, cartilage connections. Um, one thing that's really hard, though, is their skin. They don't actually have scales. If you notice that uh, most fish have scales, uh, all elasmobranchs, so rays and sharks, actually have what we call dermal denticles. And dermal denticles are actually more like teeth. That's why they're called denticles. Um, and that means they have a root 
and a hard top that has uh, these ridges grooved in them or grooves in them. And this groove reduces the hydrodynamic friction. This means that essentially it is a lot less effort for a shark to move faster. So they can move faster with less effort. And that is one of the reasons why, for example, a great white can go four months without feeding because the movement as itself doesn't cost him that much energy. All elasmobranchs have gill slits. Um, they have between five and seven gill slits. On the left, you have a manta ray. It's got five gill slits. And on the right, you've got a, a cow shark or seven gill shark that has seven gill slits. Now, if you think about it, reef fish all have gills, which means a single slit that opens. That's actually what the vast majority of fish, moray eels, all the uh, fish that we can encounter actually have single openings. Only elasmobranchs actually have these gill slits. So when all these things in common, one may wonder what actually is the difference. And here is something where some people might see a ray and other might people see a shark. Well, there is a clear distinction between sharks and rays, and it is not, as one might think, the wings. It is actually where the gills are located. So here on the left, we've got a nurse shark that likes to live on the bottom, and on the right, we've got a whip uh, ray that likes to live on the bottom. And you can see that one has the gills above his fins or next to his fins, and the ray has the gill slits under the body. And that makes essentially this intermediate form that we call the, the um, guitar rays um, a ray rather than a shark. Although to me, it looks a lot more like a shark because it still has these dorsal fins, right? But this is considered a ray because the gill slits are below the body. There's a great picture by one of my guests, Amar Abaza. Um, he got a way better picture than I got, so I'm using his picture here. Let's talk a little bit about fins. Sharks have quite a lot of fins and they're quite important for identifying the species, but they're also quite good by telling how well evolution has adapted them to their habitat. Um, and um, a lot of them, all of them are actually necessary in order to ID sharks. And I will, um, in the next talk that I'll do in a couple of weeks, give you some indication on how you can use these fins to identify the different species of sharks. Today, I just want to talk about the evolutionary adaptations to uh, the habitat or the type of diving uh, or swimming that they do. And so we're only going to talk about the three, the dorsal fin, which is the, the back fin, and the caudal fin, which is the tail fin, and the pecs or pectoral fins, which are sort of the side fins. And those are extremely adapted to the kind of uh, um, diving behavior that they have. So on the top here, you have a nurse shark who lives a lot on the bottom, does swim, but lives a lot on the bottom. And on the bottom, we've got a bull shark that is a fast swimmer, um, but can be on reefs just as much as in the open water. And you can see that the fins are very different. For example, the dorsal fin is much more forward and much more pronounced and bigger on the bull shark than it is on the nurse shark. Um, you can also see, well, in this black and white, it's not so easy to see, that the tail fin is very different. So let's have a look at uh, what the tail fin looks like. The uh, bottom growls or bottom breathers often have just a single lobe there at the back, like the nurse shark, um, and um, accelerators, so ones that are swimming pelagically and just need to be able to go fast and forward, like the great white or the mako shark, will have more of a tuna-like tail. Um, what I call the agile swimmer, so the intermediates, the ones that are on reefs and in open water, like a tiger shark, a bull shark, a gray reef shark, etc., they have a big lobe at the top and then a small lobe at the bottom, which these two can work independently from each other. So you'll see often when the shark moves that these two will actually move slightly different, which allows them to fine tune their movements quite a bit. The dorsal, I already mentioned, is very different. The bottom dweller actually has a much smaller one and much further back because they're not swimming fast uh, in open water, so they don't have that much stabilizing force. Whereas for oceanic uh, uh, sharks, both the, the pectoral fins and the dorsal fins are built for speed. Here's a picture of a great white, and you can see compared to the bull shark we saw earlier, the, the tail fin is even larger. But uh, sorry, the dorsal fin is even larger. But if you look at the tail fin, you can see it's, it's very, very similar shaped to a tuna. So it's a, it's, a, it's a paddle that essentially allows them to propel them extremely fast forward. Here we've got uh, two or actually three oceanic white tips. Uh, and you can see that from the front, you can see that they have extremely long 
uh, compared to the body uh, uh, dorsal fins, but also the pecs are extremely large. That is because they're always ocean going and they're gliding through the oceans. Here's a shark that has eluded me so far, so I'm taking this photo from Alex Mustard, uh, which is a super long uh, dorsal fin. This is probably the coolest dorsal fin of them all and the longest. That's why I would like to show it here. This is the great hammerhead, which you can encounter in Bahamas, for example. And uh, yeah, one day I hope I can take a picture like that. Um, this is from the dive center that I used in Byron Bay. I only had a little point and shoot, didn't get such good photos. But these are zebra sharks or leopard sharks. Uh, people call them differently in different countries. But this is a shark that's very well adapted to sitting on the bottom or to being on the bottom quite often. You can see that the back tail doesn't have a bottom lobe at all. So you can see it's just like a extension of the tail. And you can also see that the uh, dorsal fins, the first and the second, are both moving a lot to the back, so they're quite slanted and not sticking out high. That is because these sharks rarely ever swim long distances and therefore don't need that stabilizing force. And if you compare that with a whale shark, you can see that a whale shark is actually more closer related to a nurse shark than it is to, for example, a baskin shark. That baskin shark feeds in the same way, but is not actually related to uh, uh, a whale shark. A whale shark belongs to the family of carpet sharks, which are mostly bottom dwelling. And the way it sucks in its prey by pumping water in is actually also different to the Baskin shark because it actually pumps water in. Um, uh, like the nurse shark will pump water in to breathe, the uh, whale shark is using that as a means of hunting. Um, and that's interesting because the Baskin shark is more like, for example, a great white or something like that. And he also filter feeds, but he does it by only opening his mouth and swimming because it is a different kind of family, the family that can't pump water into their mouth. So whale shark is part of the carpet shark family. So let's talk about their teeth. They're amazing uh, different kinds of teeth that sharks have. Here's a close-up of a sand tiger. And if I go even closer, there's a couple of things we can see here. One, we can see that these uh, uh, teeth are very, very pointy and thin, and they're pointing into the mouth. That is because this shark will only eat small prey and will swallow it whole. Every time it bites, it moves further into his throat. That is probably the reason why there are no known incidents between sand tigers and humans, because uh, essentially this shark is not equipped to kill bigger prey. This shark is only equipped to, to eat prey of 50 to 60 centimeters that he can then swallow whole. Here's another thing that we can notice. We can see that there is a tooth here in the middle. I'll point it out with my mouse. Um, there's a tooth here in the middle that's almost falling out. We can also see that the gum line seems to be quite uneven. This is because of an amazing marvel that sharks keep producing teeth their entire life. On the left, we've got that uh, mouth of a sand tiger, and you can see some of those teeth are coming forward. On the right here, we can see the jaws of a great white. And you can see how these teeth are basically in preparation, ready to come out from the inside of the mouth. So there are up to seven ready teeth in the mouth, and they will come out um, in uneven form. So you can see they're sort of crossed overlapping, which means that there will never be two next to each other missing. What it does mean is that these teeth constantly feel out. And if you think about all the pictures that we see of uh, of great whites, it always looks like they've got a bloody mouth. That is actually because they have inflamed gums because they're constantly losing teeth. That's not because they've just killed something and that's what people often think, it's like a bloody mouth because they've just got blood on there like a vampire, but that's not what it is. It's just that they're constantly losing teeth and, um, and that is a good thing because that means that they are constantly with new supply of teeth for their entire life. Some sharks, like tiger sharks, have extremely well-designed teeth. If you look at those in detail, um, I found this on Wikipedia, you can see that they've got serrated edges all around the tooth and it's in a hook shape. With these teeth, they're actually able to saw into a turtle carpus. And so they are extremely uh, sharp. And with these serrated edges, they're able to, uh, to cut into extremely hard material. Here we can also very nicely see the uneven falling out. So on the left, you can see one that uh, has probably recently fallen out. Then the middle one is still further in than the right one. So you can see the one on the right is gonna go next. 
So that means that they're always going in alternating fashion, which means that they always have, that they have no gaps in their teeth, teeth front row. Some sharks actually keep their teeth inside their mouth. So here we have an oceanic black tip or here a bull shark. If you look in detail, you can see that they actually have the sharks fully submerged in their gums. That is uh, great because that means they can't actually accidentally bite you because they're not carrying around weaponry. Um, it often is per portrayed as such, but they actually have the teeth in their mouth and only when they go for something can they bring their teeth out. They have another feature, which is moving their jaw forward. So here you've got two lemon sharks. On the right, there's a lemon shark that has a mouth closed. And on the left, we've got a lemon shark who's going for this morsel that's been provided by the handler. And you can see how the jaw fully is coming out of the shark, allowing him to grab a prey or, or meat and pull it into his mouth, kind of like a snake in a way, but differently. So here the jaw fully detaches from the rest of the head, allows it, allowing the shark to have a bigger reach when they eat something. And yet another variation of these teeth is the nurse shark. If you look in detail, you can see the nurse shark has more like grinding like teeth. We call them a ton of teeth. And that's what they use to break down mollusks. So uh, uh, sh um, shells, um, snails, uh, muscles, anything like that. Um, and you can see that the teeth have more like a serrated edge and they're extremely hard. And that allows them to break down anim um, animals that they find in the sand. And then there's one really crazy one. Again, photos that uh, I haven't taken, they are uh, found online. But this is what we call the cookie cutter shark who sucks onto uh, a prey with his round mouth and has these extremely sharp bottom teeth. You can see the top teeth are more for holding and the bottom teeth are for serrating and they are meant, meant for this kind of injury. So they will latch on to all kinds of animals, including humans. There's one human who's been recorded to be attacked by a cookie cutter shark and they will take out a circular hole out of the poor animal. Fortunately, all these animals will survive that. Um, so it is in that way um, uh, not that bad. And then finally, the whale shark also has teeth, and you can see these teeth are actually quite reduced. So you can see he has up to 300 teeth there in the first row, and he actually has the hint of a second row there as well. But these teeth are only for one purpose, and that's not feeding. I'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about their amazing sets of senses. Like all sharks, they of course have eyesight, but they also have smell, electric sense, hearing, and they have a lateral line. So all of these senses help them uh, work out what their prey is and what their opponents are. So you see sharks approaching prey and opportunity with their nose first. That is, might indicate that they're smelling it. They have in fact a very good smell. They can smell uh, certain substances such as blood, but not necessarily human blood, any kind of substance, particularly if it has a lot of oil, so fats, um, it can smell it for very, very long distances, maybe up to 100 meters, 200 meters, not kilometers though, as it said, that's only if you put blood into a current and we'll bring that to a shark. But I wanna um, bust a myth here. Um, that is something that all shark scientists will tell you that essentially a shark might be able to smell you, but that is not unusual. Reef fish also are able to smell you. All fish have a capability of detecting smell. And uh, the question is uh, if they're gonna respond to it. And that is the second myth buster that I wanna see is sharks can smell you, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna come for you because it doesn't actually interest him what uh, a human tastes like. A human has very little fats in his blood and the typical prey for sharks is either fish and if possible, fatty fish, um, uh, or something like a, a tiger shark might go for a sea lion, um, sorry, a great white might go for a sea lion and a tiger shark might go for a turtle. But these are very specific smells. They're not actively going for humanoid animals. There's no sharks that hunt for, for say monkeys. So sharks are not interested in our blood. So even if they can smell us, they're not gonna go for us. One shark scientist from Australia once said to me, 
we humans can also smell a landfill over several kilometers, but it does not mean that we're wanting to go for dinner there. So that's a good analogy. So even if a shark will be able to smell you, doesn't mean that that shark would then want to eat you. Sharks also have what we call an electric sense. It's not quite right. It's, uh, it's an ability to detect human, or human, sorry, uh, uh, natural occurring electricity, which means every human being creates a certain electric pulse that is primarily from the heart that gets electric impulses to beat. And sharks can detect that with these little holes on their face. You can see all sharks have more or less of these holes, and those holes allow the shark to detect if there is life there. And this was discovered, discovered by somebody called Lorenzini, and these are called the ampullae of Lorenzini. Not a namesake, unfortunately. I still think it's very cool that there's a part of the shark that sounds very similar to my last name. Um, but he discovered these uh, pores are basically gel-filled uh, um, um, holes that at the bottom have these sort of very fine hairs in there. And these hairs are directly connected to the nerve system, and that allows them to detect um, life. Some sharks have adapted variations on that, like, for example, the bristles on these nurse sharks, allowing them to feel for life inside the sand. But the most famous adaptation to that is the hammerhead. So here now, if you look at this uh, photo by Julian Morris of a great hammerhead, you can see that the um, the, the uh, ampullae of Lorenzini are, are spread out over the whole head. And that is the reason why the hammerhead has this crazy headed shape. There are nine types of, uh, of hammerhead species that we know of, and they are coming all the way from a bonnet shark that has a small head to a winghead shark, and they all, a winghead hammerhead, and they all have the purpose of hunting on sand. So you will see that even the great hammerhead and also the scalloped hammerhead generally hunt for things in the sand. Bigger hammerheads go for stingrays, smaller ones might go for fish or, or indeed snails and such and crabs. So that is why they have this crazy head. Evolution has made their head wider so to spread out these electric sensors. These electric sensors also means that you can manage a shark with it. So here in Fiji, uh, with this feisty tiger shark, the handlers would only have to touch the nose of the shark gently in order for the shark to change direction. But if there is a shark that is well known to humans, some sharks actually respond really well to being rubbed on the nose. So here you can see a famous shark called Snooty in Florida being rubbed on the nose by the handler. And that is something that obviously you shouldn't try yourself, and only experienced people should do. But essentially, because this is so sensitive, this area, some sharks really, really enjoy being rubbed on the nose there. These holes actually continue on the side of the head and along the lateral line. So they continue along the entire part of the body. They're a little bit different than the ampullae of Lorenzini, but it's essentially the same thing. And this lateral line allows the shark to swim past another human, uh, sorry, another natural being and detect how large they are. And that is a, a way how sharks size you up when they swim past you and they size up prey and they size up each other. By swimming past them, they can detect where does it start, where does it end, and it will tell them how large an animal is. So in summary, a shark can see you, can smell you, he can sense you, and he can size you up. But actually, one sense we haven't mentioned yet, which is the strongest, he can actually hear you. So before he smells you, he will actually hear you. The range of shark hearing, which is a hearing organ that is actually doesn't have any external holes, it's located inside the head and uses the skeleton structure to detect uh, sound, can hear up to several kilometers. So if you make noise underwater, not only uh, will you get the shark's attention, you will most likely scare them away, which is why when we dive with sharks, I generally recommend to try to breathe very slowly and try to also not exhale in a sort of burst fashion, but to try to like breathe out very gently. Okay, let's come to shark love. And why am I using this image? That is because when you see a shark like this with this scarring and fresh wounds on the sides of their head, that means it is a female. And that is essentially because sharks have a very weird way of having sexual intercourse. First, what is a male, what's a female? Males are the ones that have two things. We're 
men, humans have one thing. So they don't call them the P word, they call them claspers, which is great. So I don't have to use the P word. Uh, sharks have claspers and they have two of them. And I will show you later why they have two of them. But when you can see them extending over the pelvic fins in terms of length, then you know you've seen, uh, you're seeing an adult male. If you see them having these short, uh, uh, claspers, which are not longer than the pelvic fin, that means it's a sub-adult and is not yet ready to mate. Females essentially have nothing, so when you see a shark that has no uh, cuts or anything in the pelvic area, that means it's a female. Now, another way to tell females is if you see bite marks like these, and you can see this oceanic black tip has crazy bite marks, um, really fresh wounds there. And why is that? That is because they are uh, mating in a very, very uh, aggressive fashion. Here you see one, uh, a gray reef shark, covered in bite marks. And these bite marks have already been faded out, so you can see it's scarring. But that also immediately tells you that that is a female because the way sharks mate looks like this. The male will bite onto the female on the side of the gill area or the fin and hold on to her while he's injecting his clasper into her cloaca. That's her name for the female organ. And as you can see here, they're actually doing it across. So if the female is on the right side, he will use his less clasper to enter her cloaca. And if the female is on the Left side, it will use his right clasper. So this is the way how they mate, and that is why they have the two, so that they can get better to where they need to go. And actually, all of them have that. So even manta rays, stingrays, etc. if you look, you will see that males always have the two claspers. Here's a, a great photo by Tony Wu, or rather a series of, I think these are cat eye sharks. Um, and here you can see how the male is taking the entire fin into his mouth in order to bring her into position to then uh, uh, again uh, use his clasper to mate with her. Here's uh, some amazing photos from um, Edward Hereno in Mexico, or sorry in Costa Rica, um, where you can see uh, white tips, white tip reef sharks, um, mating with each other and you can see how the males are latching onto the females in a pretty brutal fashion but essentially it's worked for 400 million years, so what are you gonna say? It works. And here we finally come to the conclusion why the whale sharks still have teeth. They have this row of teeth very likely in order to be able to mate. Now we don't know that because yet there has been no uh, recording of a mating ritual, but we know it from manta rays who are also filter feeders and also still have teeth. And we do know uh, that manta rays bite onto the wingtip of the female in order to bring into position to mate. So therefore we believe that that is why whale shark still have teeth. And if you wonder if males and females both have the teeth, yes, both males and females still have this row of teeth, mantas and whale sharks both do. And the reason is the same why men have nipples. We have absolutely no function for it, but it is a very important function in our, uh, in our um, life cycles, which is why men also have nipples. When they come out, they're born ready. They come out as a fully functional individual that has to fend for themselves. There is no mother love, as far as we know anyway, between sharks and small sharks have to fend for themselves immediately. But there are different ways how they can come out. They can come out of an egg. This is the cl classic mermaid's pocket. And that is what they call oviparous, eggs, ov. I think that's how you can remember it. There's another one called viviparous, that I think is easier to remember because it's alive. That means the shark gives birth to live pups. They come live out of the female. And then there is a, what is now thought to be the biggest group, which they call ovoviparous, which is both together. And essentially that is eggs that hatch inside the body and then grow inside the body until they're ready to leave. So these are the different types. Um, this is one of the uh, famous ones that lays not a mermaid's pocket but a egg with sort of a, a twist function and that is uh, one of the horn sharks. i'm not quite sure which one this is it might be a port jackson or a horn shark i think it's a horn shark in australia not my photo i um, apologize i don't have the uh, watermark here um, but essentially they uh, lay eggs and screw them into crevices in order to protect them from other sharks um, primarily until the shark is ready to come out and here's a picture by Dr. Simon Pierce, one of the leading whale shark scientists in the world, of a pregnant 
female whale shark. And you can see she's got a huge bulge behind her pelvic fins. This is above her cloaca. And even though we don't know how they mate and we don't really know where they give birth, once a long time ago, a Taiwanese uh, fishing boat caught a pregnant female. And when they slaughtered her, they found 300 ready to go whale sharks in there. Um, and these whale sharks probably come out in uh, a length not much uh, shorter than this, so 50 to 60 centimeters, and um, come out and have to immediately fend for themselves. When they come out, they generally will stay into shark, into shark sanctuaries. Here's a picture of a classic shark sanctuary that you can find on every Maldivian island. If you go into the shallows, like my wife Kate here in, in the left, um, then you can find baby reef sharks. This is a baby black tip shark, and these will basically stay in the shallows until they're big enough to go out. Gray reef sharks will actually venture out during daytime uh, a little bit earlier, but they will only go out in big schools. So in the last few years, we've been very lucky to see several schools of baby gray reefs in the Maldives, also in Palau, good places to see gray reef sharks in big numbers. And they will school, they'll stay together, making it harder for predators to hunt them. And here you see a predator, which is actually a grown adult gray reef which are known to be cannibalists. So these little baby sharks actually have to be aware of their own kind. And that's why they stay in big schools together uh, during the day. And at night, they're thought to be going back into the reef. All right, let's come to a couple of tips for divers um, when you dive with sharks. First of all, I think shark diving is not dangerous. The only thing that is dangerous is negligence. As long as you know what you're doing around sharks, I don't think it's actually dangerous. The most important thing, as with all wild animals, don't act as prey. If you get cornered by uh, street dogs, you also shouldn't run. All you indicate to the predator, you're afraid and therefore you are prey. So make sure you don't retreat from a shark. Don't swim away finning hard, that just uh, might attract their attention. Equally, please don't treat them as prey. If you start swimming towards a shark, that shark thinks, oh, wow, that predator is coming towards me, must think, must think I'm stronger or I'm weaker than it, so it will swim away. And let me, let me tell you, you're not going to chase any shark. You're not even going to be able to keep up with a whale shark. So don't swim after them. Rather, try to watch for patterns. So here, for example, in the blue corner in Palau, you can see the sharks move. And if you want to see them from the front, this is not the right position. Here you can see always their tail. So if you want to see them from the front, you would want to move further to the right. That's where they would arrive. Sharks often follow patterns. Sometimes when you see a shark disappearing, don't go after him. Just wait in the same spot. He might actually be coming back. Once you've noticed their patterns, make sure you don't come into their vicinity. Here you see an unfortunate situation where a friend of mine got into the front of a cow shark, nothing happened, but could have happened, so definitely a dangerous situation. By the way, if you see here on the left, you can see some scratch marks that might just be from an older mating ritual, just FYI. So don't get into their way, and make sure you keep an eye on them. Whatever shark you dive with, you always want to keep an eye on them. This is a, a sub-adult tiger shark that whenever we were diving in bikini from the wrecks towards the boat, this shark would approach and he would very often come from behind. This is known for many sharks, for example, uh, silver tips, um, uh, silkies, makos often come from behind. Make sure whenever you're diving, you know that there is nothing behind you. Make sure you look behind you. For example, with oceanic white tips, this is really quite a dangerous situation when you're at the surface because their main hunting area is zero to six meters. So if you're in this area, Basically, you want to get out of the water as soon as possible. And definitely, definitely, you don't want to be swimming on your back, not looking in the water, because the sharks seem to notice that. And this was a situation I captured uh, uh, where you could see an oceanic white tip actually investigating a diver. Nothing happened, but in the following season was last year. Uh, so this is three years ago. And last year, we had a lot of incidents uh, with oceanic white tips. And so therefore the park had to be closed so that they could figure out why these oceanic white tips were so aggressive. So keep an eye on the oceanic white tip for sure, because they are a beautiful animal, but they are sneaky. And if you're not looking at them, they might uh, come for you. Also watch their body language. So if their fins are down, that's not a good sign. That means they're trying to accelerate and they're doing that because 
they are either hunting or they're afraid. So these signs here, the buckling is a bit rare to see, but the fins down you can definitely see means that the sharks are more aggressive. So if you see that something's up when they're hunting or they're fighting or, or, or something like that, you see the fins down, that means they're much, there's much more adrenaline involved and you want to stay away from that. So in that case, you want to stay away or if you can't be away, stay low. This is with the pregnant uh, bull sharks in, um, in uh, Playa del Carmen, Mexico, where if you do this dive where they provision, we need to stay extremely low. The bottom is a good spot to be. That's where sharks attack less likely. Um, those few professionals that dive with great whites will also tell you that you need to stay on the bottom in order to be in a better position. If there is no bottom, like with the oceanic white tip, make sure you stay below them you're always in a better spot when you're below them because they prefer to attack up. If you're surrounded, here's a picture of Terry in Florida. If you are surrounded by sharks, these are harmless lemon sharks, but still you should stay vertical in the water, water column. This allows you to turn much easier and much easier to turn your head around to look for sharks. So if you are not on the bottom, make sure you're vertical which allows you to keep an eye on the sharks. Also, it allows you to much better to adjust your buoyancy and to turn around. So when you are surrounded by shark and you're vertical, make sure you keep your hands together. This is the hunter who still has some fish in his box there. And so the sharks are very interested in him. And what he does is keeping his arms close to the body, make sure you are not exposing something like your hand sticking out of a wetsuit could be considered like a small fish. So it's something that you wanna make sure you're not exposing. If you're moving your hands, for example, to adjust your camera, make sure you do it slowly and deliberately and not fast and rig it because that again could be a flash of a movement. This is in Fiji um, and uh, a friend, my friend Dan has taken photos. But important is that when you change your strobe settings or your angle, the position of your strobes, that you do this slowly and deliberately. Keep something between you and the shark. Here you can see the shark getting past the lady, but the strobes are in the way. Here, is, here I am with some lemon sharks, and you can see the camera is between me and the shark. So if the shark comes too close, like this cow shark in South Africa, you're able to put the camera forward. My dome got a scratch, but nothing happened to my hands or myself, so that is a good save. So if you have a camera, it's a very useful thing to have because you have something between you and the shark. And last but not least, don't do what I did in this photo. This was back in the day when I was so excited about sharks um, that I did some selfies. That's obviously extremely stupid uh, because the sharks are behind you and you can't keep an eye on them. So make sure you don't do that. And with that, I would like to close my uh, webinar. So we have some questions here in the Q&A. For example, we have some question here about shark provisioning. I mentioned that earlier that I'm generally not opposed as long as it's done in a way um, that, that um, you know, doesn't change the behavior of sharks, but also that essentially is not too much food so that the sharks fully rely on them. We have another question here from Lola, what I think about uh, cage diving. So generally cage diving is the only way to get close to um, uh, tiger, um, great whites. So in uh, uh, Guadeloupe Island, Mexico, in uh, South Australia, and until recently in South Africa, there are places where you can see great whites, and it is literally the only way how you can safely see great whites. And so as long as they adhere to the uh, feeding principles, don't overfeed the sharks, I think it's okay uh, to do cage diving. I personally don't necessarily like it that much because you don't have fins on, you can't swim, um, you're kind of caged in a box when the sharks are free around you. It's kind of not my number one feeling. So although uh, I'm not against it, it's not my number one uh, thing. Um, I got here a couple questions in the Q&A about what my favorite dives were and what my favorite sharks um, are. So I'll start with my favorite dive ever was this dive that I had earlier there in Southwest Rocks. Um, still to this day, my very best dive with sharks. There, are, there were all these sand tigers, these are big, big sharks, as you could see, two and a half to three meters. And uh, they cruise in this area. And one time we had very clear water and the, um, the dive master said to me and my uh, friend that I was with that we could go in 
first and had the sharks to herself. So it was just me and my friend there at the bottom of the sea uh, with all these sharks. And the sharks were um, extremely calm because it was just the two of us. Then that was a very, very good experience in terms of shark dives, probably my best one. Uh, sharks that I like the most to photograph, I mean, there's a lot of sharks that I think are really great to photograph, but I think oceanic white tips are, uh, sorry, oceanic black tips are great, oceanic white tips are great because they interact with you. Um, tiger sharks always find you have to be really quite careful around them. And also bull sharks, uh, you need to be very, very careful around them when they come close. I mean, it, it is a, a, a man eater. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. So I find that there is quite a lot of tension. Um, so I prefer to shoot uh, uh, these other type of sharks or whale sharks, of course. But uh, my biggest dream still is uh, to dive with a great hammerhead and a mako shark. Those are on my top list. Haven't had the uh, luck yet to find them. Have looked for them a couple of times, but I haven't found them yet. But those would be the ones that I would like to see the most. So um, yeah, I think we'll conclude there. I just want to point out a couple of upcoming uh, webinars. So we have uh, the second part of our Lightroom talk on Monday, 6th of April. Um, check it out on our website, insideracademy.com. Uh, we essentially uh, uh, have the first Lightroom part uh, already there as a recording on YouTube and Facebook. And, and if you watch that, then you can join the next session. Uh, we also have Jay Clue here next week, um, going to tell us about Baja California, about Mako sharks, hammerhead sharks, mobulas, um, uh, and uh, whales. Uh, oh, and his Marlin starting run. So he will tell us all the amazing things. Baja California is the place to be right now. So make sure you join for that. I'm actually doing a talk at his webinar series about shark photography. So if you want to see that, the link is also on ours, but it's essentially a, uh, um, it's a, a talk at Dive Ninjas. Um, and then every Monday we'll have more Lightroom sessions. Um, and on Thursday, the 16th of April, I'll do a manta ray talk. So it's very similar to this shark talk, but we're going to focus on manta rays and mobulas. So if you are interested, please join into those. And now I would like to thank you very much for your attention and wishing you a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.